in order to bring about the transformation that this country needs. Not what these folks can do, but how much are you going to do? Because sometimes we have a tendency to sit back and, and gripe and complain and say they ain't going to do nothing. But what have, what have we asked them to do? Has every pastor in the community come forward with an agenda for change that they presented to uh, the congressmen, the senators, and said, we want to work in partnership with you, and we'll hold you accountable. We'll hold you accountable if you don't do it, but we take it upon ourselves also to do some work in this process. Uh, have we made sure that every single person in our household is registered to vote? Uh, you know, have we uh, even, you know, we talk about education a lot. Nobody is fighting harder than I am to make sure that we've got equitable funding for public schools all across the country. And nobody is fighting harder than Bob Menendez to do the same. Because both of us have benefited from an education. But you know, one of the things that I often say is that, uh, you know, all that money's not going to make a dime's bit of difference if when, uh, when we put that money in, into the schools, the kids come home and the parents aren't willing to turn off the television set and set aside a, a quiet place to do the homework and call the teacher of your child once in a while to find out how they're doing. And we as neighbors and friends aren't looking after each other's children and imposing some discipline on our streets and on our communities. The reason I say that is not to let the politicians off the hook, but it's to describe the sense that all of us should have that we are empowered to bring about the kind of lives that we want. That we have choices. Not only does government have choices, but we individually have choices. This election that's coming up is going to be about the choices that we exercise. It's going to be whether we genuinely believe that we can make the country better or whether we're just talking about it. It's whether we are genuinely angry about what we've seen uh, or whether we've just grown complacent. If, in fact, uh, we feel as frustrated as I do about the potential that's been lost, uh, then I know we're going to work hard. And we're going to especially work hard for Bob Menendez because we have the opportunity to take back the Senate and we have the opportunity to take back the House. And I can promise you that if Donald Payne uh, is a, a senior member or a chairman of a committee or a subcommittee, and if Bob Menendez and Frank Lautenberg are in charge, you will see different priorities here in East Orange. There will be a difference. And I don't, you don't need to take it on faith. Bob Menendez has a track record. You go back and do the research. Don't take my word for it. Look at how he's voted on issues that are important to East Orange. Look at whether he's committed to putting more money into education. See if he's worked uh, in partnership with community organizations to try to make sure that they've got health care and economic development and the kinds of things that all of you care about. You know his track record. So the question is, how hard are we going to work? How hard are we going to work? Now, let me close by saying this. It's hard to work if you don't feel whole. And so I just want to remind people that in this country, uh, hope is the most magical ingredient in terms of making things happen. You know, none of us, most of us wouldn't be here if our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents in the shadow of slavery and Jim Crow hadn't felt hope. When I hear folks complaining about how bad things are now, I tell them it was a lot worse for those folks. And they worked hard and they didn't give up hope. So just in case any of you losing hope, uh, I just want to hold myself up as Exhibit A. I, I told you that two years ago not that many people knew who I was. When I announced that I was running for the United States Senate, despite having a strong track record in the state Senate, folks said, well, you know, he'd be a good state uh, U.S. Senator, but the fact is that uh, Illinois are not going to elect a, a brother named Obama. <laughs> that, 
is not going to happen. <laughs> and we had a field of seven candidates. In the Democratic primary, we had a field of seven candidates. Well-qualified candidates, smart candidates. One guy was the favorite son of the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, and his father had been the chairman of the party. He was the sitting state comptroller. Fine young man, had all the endorsements from all the organizations. Uh, there was uh, a guy who was worth $400 million, who spent $30 million in the race. And primary day comes, and uh, I had won by 30 points. And everybody was shocked, and nobody was more surprised than I was. <laughs> and we hadn't had a lot of money, so we had to spend most of our money uh, in Chicago. We had to spend most of our money in Chicago uh, on television, and so we hadn't been able to advertise in Southern Illinois. And so Dick Durbin, the senior United States Senator, came to me and he said, uh, listen, let's take a, a, a tour of downstate Illinois. And I said, let's go. So. We took a 39-city, five-day tour of Southern Illinois. And we went to Hillsboro and Murfreesboro and Collinsville and Caseyville. And we went to every hill and borough and hill <laughs> in Southern Illinois. And for those of you who, uh, who don't know Illinois, uh, Southern Illinois is the South. <laughs> And the southernmost part of Illinois is closer to Little Rock than it is to Chicago. And one of the cities that we visited was, was a place called Cairo, Illinois. And, and y'all hearing some folks go, hmm, because back in the late 60s and early 70s, Cairo was the site of some of the worst uh, racial violence of anywhere in the nation, as bad as anything going on in Mississippi or Alabama. I mean, you had... Uh, cross burnings and an active white citizens council and you had uh, uh, seg de facto segregated schools. Folks couldn't get jobs in the local businesses, wouldn't hire blacks. And eventually there were some, some riots and National Guard had to come in. So as we're driving down there, Dick Durbin says, you know, the first time I went to Cairo was during this period. is back in the late 60s, early 70s. And he was then a young attorney, had been sent down by the lieutenant governor uh, to investigate what could be done to improve the situation in Cairo, improve the racial climate. So he goes down there, takes a bus, gets picked up, local volunteer drives him to the motel where he's going to be staying. He's about to uh, get out of the car, the guy grabs him and says, listen, uh, let me give you a piece of advice, young man. Dermot says, what's that? He says, Whatever you do, don't use the telephone in your motel room. Durbin says, why not? He says, well, uh, the switchboard operator is a member of the White Citizens Council and is going to report everything that you say. So this makes Durbin concerned, but he's got a job to do. He checks in, goes up, starts unpacking his bags. Here's a knock on the door. Opens up the door. There's a guy standing there. Mean looking guy. Asks him, what are you doing here? Starts walking away. And now Durbin's really getting nervous. And so am I. Because we're pulling in the Cairo, right as you tell me this story. So we, we pull in the, the, the set in, go around the old county courthouse, and we come across a a big uh, parking lot. Looks like there are about 300 people sitting there. <laughs> Didn't know what was going on. We get closer, I notice they're all of an age where they might have been active and might have been taking place <laughs> 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> we get closer still, and I notice actually the crowd is about a quarter black, three quarters white. And we pull in, get out of the van, and I noticed that suddenly everybody's wearing these little blue buttons that says, Obama for USA. <laughs> and they're handing barbecue and they're waving and wanting to take pictures. And I looked at Durbin and he looked at me. 
and we knew what the other person was singing. If you had told Dick Durk uh, 20, 30 years ago that he, the son of Lithuanian immigrants, born in the near poverty, father dies when he's only 13 years old, mother had to raise him despite suffering debilitating cancer. If you had told Durbin that he would be coming back to Cairo as the senior United States son, and that he would have with him a black guy born in Hawaii with a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas. Right. Folks would have said you're crazy. <laughs> Wouldn't have believed it. And yet it was happening. Which reminds us of something Dr. King said two weeks after Bloody Sunday, two weeks after the marchers had, had been turned back and suffered beatings and the horses and the tear gas. Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It bends towards justice. And we have to keep that in mind. We can't always see God's purpose. But that arc bends towards justice. Here's the only thing, it doesn't bend on its own. It bends because we put our hands on that arc and we bend it in the direction of justice. And so the question that I'm going to leave with you here today is, how committed are you to bending that arc in the direction of justice? Uh, are you going to put your hand on that arc? Are you going to organize? Are you going to mobilize? Are you going to make phone calls? Are you going to get registered? Are you going to do all the things that are required to make sure that we bring about a change in this country and to make sure that you re-elect an outstanding United States Senator that all of us will benefit from, Bob Menendez, East Orange, I know you're going to do it. Thank you very much. God bless you.